Hello there and welcome to another episode of the Skylander Spires Adventure Developer Commentary. This time we are answering your questions. Today I'm going to be talking to design analyst Mike Stout. And since we finished all of the gameplay, this is going to be more of a podcast video. There are going to be tiny things here and there that pop up, but for the majority it's just audio. But I hope you enjoy it regardless. There's a lot of cool stuff we talk about. Enjoy. I'll bet we can bang through at least 50 or 60 of them. Let's do it. Well, we'll see. First off. So many people wanted to thank you and everyone else for your work on the games because they have truly changed people's lives. Um, so, thank you. Um, like it's it's awesome. It's been awesome just hearing all of your stories um, throughout the series. It's, it's just it's, it's it's been wonderful. I agree. I've had a lot of t uh, I've had a lot of good time listening to everybody else talk about uh, the series as well. It kind of gives an idea of just how massive it was and how many people were involved doing how many different things in how many different places. Cause like the fact that that game was able to be, you know, made high quality every year with toys shipped everywhere. It's a miracle, man. And it's yeah. so many people. Yeah. <laughs> and you kind of get a glimpse of that. Now you, you, you had people talking about, you know, the, the toy making process in addition to the game making process and how the two had to sync up. Yeah, exactly. Uh, however improbably that those might be and how Activision had to learn how to make toys. It was a very, very large thing. And I think while we were all going through it, all of us were just impressed by how much larger it was than we were. But it was, it was definitely good to have done something that means so much to so many people. Uh, there's, a, there's a set of questions that like tons of people asked. <laughs> Um, All right. The first, I very much doubt. Well, I'm, I'm going to ask everyone a, a couple of these questions, and or the people I'm talking to, and I'm aware that some of these you'll be like, I can't comment on this, or I simply don't know. Uh, but if I okay. don't ask it, people will shout at me. Is there any chance for another game in the future? I know what you're going to say. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Isn't there a game out right now? Uh, like a mobile game? Yeah, I think there is. Yeah, it came out fairly recently, yeah. but like uh, I, I think people are looking for. But it, I don't know. Right? Yeah. I don't know anything about yeah. it. Yeah, sorry. yeah, uh, yeah. And I mean, even if you did, you would not be allowed to say. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, everyone. Not. Yeah. I'm sorry, everyone. Yeah. I know you will want me to ask that. It, embargoes and NDAs are <laughs> embargoes and NDAs. We, we we can't do anything about that. People were interested about fan games. Um, uh -huh. and creating non-profit fan games of stuff like Spyro or Skylanders. Um, and I know that you're not necessarily in charge of that decision, uh, but like, mm. what, what's the general stance on uh, fan games? Are they allowed if they are 100% free to play? From what I've seen so far, uh, in terms of like fan games that have gotten taken down and fan games that haven't gotten taken down, uh, if you're using trademarked stuff, like if you're calling it Link, if you're calling it Zelda, and you're calling it The Legend of Zelda, you're probably going to get asked to take him down. But if it's a spiritual successor and everything's different, but you know that it's that, I've never seen anyone get in trouble for that. Mm. But don't use other people's trademark things without their permission, or you're probably going to get asked to have it taken down is basically what it seems to be. Yeah, that's interesting, because there are some really cool like, creative projects that um, people have made. Um just out of I out know of love. like like I I love a lot of them but <laughs> unfortunately the legal departments what the one that takes it down right not the not the developers uh, and it has to do with from what I've been told the way trademark law works is if you don't defend it then you can never defend it right so uh, like they a, a lot of the ones that survive survive because they didn't get hundreds and hundreds of stories written about them, right? And a few that uh, that did, they got hundreds of stories written about them. Well, they got the attention of the guy of Sauron and got asked to get taken down or changed so that they don't reference the uh, uh, the trademark. So what I'd say is, like, you know, ukulele isn't Banjo Kazooie, right? Yes. Uh, it is totally Banjo Kazooie. Yeah. <laughs> Right? Absolutely, and and ukulele in the impossible lair is definitely not Donkey Kong Country, except it <laughs> absolutely is, and it's made by the same developers. <laughs> nobody's mad about that. Nobody's lawyers called anybody's lawyers about that, and they made money, right? So, uh, just don't use people's trademarks is basically what it comes down to. 
So Crystal Blazier asks, uh, if you've seen it, what do you think of the Netflix series Skylanders Academy? Oh, I love it. I love it so much. Uh, I know that there are things in it that are different from the way we did it in the games, but I, I love those things too. Mm. They're just so charming, you know, like it, it's its own kind of, uh, I've seen the first two seasons. I haven't seen the third one yet. Uh, and like, <laughs> I think it's hilarious. Uh, I love their take on uh, Glumshanks, for example. Yes, Glumshanks is great. Yeah, and uh, and Chaos always is great, but I love how they put him into the context of, you know, the the what was the gang? Oh, the the Doom Raiders. Yeah, the that he sort of like wanted so badly to be accepted by them, or within the context of like his relationship with his mom, like it instead of him just being like a big bad guy, it was kind of like how chaos gets to the point where he's the big bad guy. And I thought that was really fun. He, the, their take on Eon, I really like also. Uh, he's hilarious. Like his beard is its own character. <laughs> That's such a good idea. Uh, you know, pre, pre floating head spirit Eon. Aluminum's Gamer asks, between the custom Skylanders for Imaginators, the Swap 4 Skylanders, and the Supercharger Vehicles and the Travel Bosses and all that jazz, uh, which one of these would the developers consider to be the hardest to create and manage for the respective games at the time? Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I told you, there's you know, some I, really good questions in here. <laughs> I, I think when you ask these to the, the people who worked development side on on each of them you're probably going to get the same answer i'm thinking of which is that the the last one was the hardest one because you had to support everything from all the previous ones mm. uh every every decision that you made in a previous game you know uh you had to go back and support in subsequent games i think a lot of people talked about this in the series but it's it's definitely worth highlighting it's that like we had 32 i think skylanders uh in the first yeah 32. game and then we made giants and we added another what 30 something plus yeah i think it was giants. like 16 new some returning and, and the giants yeah something like that right and then there was the light core guys and uh the, you know so the giants added another set but it had to support all of the spyro's adventure stuff right like uh if you had leveled your Spyro's Adventure Gilgrunt up to its level cap, uh, we needed to support that. And furthermore, we had to figure out what that meant, right? Like, okay, so these toys have blue bases, and the blue bases can be raised up to level X, right? But these toys have orange bases, and they can be, right? Like, figuring all that stuff out got more and more complicated as time went on. And I think people, uh, based on at least anecdotal evidence from my family members who kept asking me like wait does this one work with this one if i get this can they use these to like what do i what do i want to get right uh so it was it seems like it ended up being compli uh, a complex situation for consumers too but for us like every game it just got more and more and more stuff that you had to support before you even got started on making content for the new game so it, it was a a major undertaking in that regard because every time you made another one we we I, I i think it was a good decision to to go back and not support you know to the backwards compatibility of the toys because if you're like you imagine a really young kid right who has this toy that they went on an adventure with and they want to play that toy on the new game and they can't that doesn't it doesn't feel good do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. In our user testing of the game, one thing we found was that a lot of people felt like, uh, you know, like when you had a favorite toy as a kid, you had a relationship with that toy, right? Mm. It's like Toy Story. Yeah, in a way, right? It, it you know, I had a stuffed, uh, a stuffed dog toy, right? That was really important to me or a, a baby blanket right and those things with with the stuffed dog or, or you know with any kind of toy uh you can take it with you into wherever you're going into your next stage of life but if we all of a sudden just said well no right you can't that that arrests something that was sort of really important to the whole concept of the game right which was that inside this plastic toy is a living creature 
right? And that that creature comes to life when you put it on the portal. And so we we guarded that as much as we could, you know, to, to try to make sure that we wouldn't break that. But it, it really meant for a huge investment uh, in backwards compatibility. Every time they switched from Toys for Bob developing one to Vicarious Visions developing one, because they were each using different engines, whoever got it would have to re-implement all of the stuff that was done for the previous game. So it would be as if no work had been done, right? You'd just have to, to do it from scratch. But the you know, all the research and development work is done, you know where you're you know what you're trying to hit. But it's it's sort of recreation from scratch rather than like just getting to build on what you made before. Uh, how much do you know about uh, the character Hex and its development? I don't know much about the development, but I, I do love the character Hex. Yeah, there was someone who wants to know about the development, but since you didn't... As much as I can remember about Hex, uh, she had another name in development. It had the working name Shadow Maid, apparently. Shadow Maid, that, that's it, thank you. Yeah, so um, I remember her being very similar to the way she she shipped but uh i also remember that she was the first character i noticed to fill a gameplay role that i need to take a couple steps back here uh normally like when we think about the skylanders uh each of them is better at solving a certain class of problems than another skylander so in the starter pack we always tried to give you one Skylander that was good at solving a different set of problems. So in the, the first one, it was uh, Stealth Elf. She was very good at solving problems at close range. Uh, and then we had, uh, who was, it was Spyro, right, was the second one. Uh, and Spyro was, since he had that straight ahead shot attack, he was the best in the group at attacking things that weren't behind cover, but they were at distance or across gaps. And I think Eruptor was the third one. It was Trigger Happy. Thank you. Yeah, and, and then Spyro also had a movement ability, right? Where he was doing damage by moving him around. Spyro and Wrecking Ball both had that kind of thing. Uh, so the you can sort of see how they were meant to solve different classes of problems. Like Trigger Happy, he had that straight ahead attack, but he also had a lobbed attack that could go over cover. Uh, Spyro had the straight ahead attack but then also had that moving around business uh and stealth elf had like close range but she she all she was very quick and agile and you can get places fast right uh we when it came to shadow maid uh or hex eventually she had an indirect attack which was different than a lot of the other things had she could just push a button and skulls would rain down from the sky uh, and it wasn't like, um, with all of the other things I just described, the player's position relative to the enemy's position is important, right? Like, in order to hit someone with Spyro's straight ahead attack, I have to be lined up and pointed at them before I press it in order to, uh, throw trigger happy's things similarly, right? I have to be at the right range. Uh, Stealth Elf was all about range, but Hex, you press the button and skulls just come out, right? So you could, you, it was kind of like a mini turret in Ratchet and Clank, right? It was something you could deploy and then move around and use something else to solve a problem while that was deployed. And, and that was sort of new for, for the Skylander problem solving ability set. Uh, and that's the main reason I remember her. I also really liked her in the uh, Skylanders Academy series. And that was a uh, seventh court official was asking about that. Uh, Crazy Curry uh, wants to know if there were other original game Spyro characters besides uh, Spyro, Cinder, and Moneybags, who was basically Uruk. There's also Sparks. Uh, yes, yes. Um... The only one that we didn't bring in was Hunter, really, that we thought of. Uh, and I'm not sure why we never brought in Hunter. I don't think we ever considered any of the other playables from Spyro 3. Uh, I mean, okay, so Persephone the Fairy, uh, she's not 
explicitly from uh, Spyro, but the the fact that she's a fairy is because of Spyro, if that makes sense. Yeah, she's a bit like Zoe. Shaky Shako asks, uh, were there any plans um, for making an open world Skylanders game, or maybe even a Skylanders game with a third person camera? Uh, not that I remember. The set camera was because we were making it originally for the Wii. As a platform, it was just useful to have the set camera because the Wii didn't have two analog sticks. Max Blocker 2.0 asks, how many assets would have to be remade when porting characters from the old games into the newer ones, and how long roughly would that take? Oh, I'm not sure about the how long aspect of it. Uh, I mean, it seems to me like it would just be really difficult. I mean, it takes a long time to make a character. Uh, even if you had, like, let's say you, you didn't have to worry about technology. Let's say you, you had all of the, the art, uh, and let's say somehow magically, <laughs> <laughs> okay, let, actually no, because I'm having to qualify this so much, I probably shouldn't. So, uh, when your art, so say your, your character models for all the Skylanders and all their animations, that's usually set up, uh, like when... When you when you think about what's on the disc, right? Uh, what's on the disc is not the original animation files created in the animation program. It's the the engine the 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 files that have been compressed and munged and you know a, a everything that you can think of as efficient as possible and expunged of all extra crap, right? and then made for that one engine to read it as fast as possible, right? Uh, if you're trying to switch from, from that in one engine to another, what you have to do is, is get all of the original files from the original animation program, figure out a way to export them into your new engine, and then re-export them all. And that's assuming that that works one-to-one, -one, right? Like, what probably happens is you export them all and then 80% of them are there and the rest you, you have to have the animators look through and, and fix, you know, and, uh, and that's just getting those assets, right? So once you've got that, and then not to mention all of the sound effects, right? So you've got uh, a Skylander is a character model, uh, a bunch of animations to move the character model around, some logic that dictates what happens when you press the buttons and some special effects that happens when you use the attacks plus also uh thinking about like all of their upgrades uh you know making sure that the upgrade tree system works for them all of that right uh besides the sound assets and the character model files and the animations none of that comes over all of the rest of that has to be recreated from scratch to look just like the old one. Right. Wow. Uh, and if there's one thing that is not inspiring creative work, it's just taking, taking it, it's, it's, it's doing a whole bunch of work on something. So this is the difference. It's really, really important, but man, is it not super fun? You know, like solving new problems, super fun, right? Like, uh, but going back and and just making it look like effort, like cause, like they did, right? They made it they made it look as if they had just used it's the same ones, right? So that it is a massive amount of work. Uh, exactly how much and how long it took, I don't know that I could say because I wasn't involved in that. But just I hope I can give you kind of an idea. Yeah. So, like, going on a small tangent then, because there was the whole Dexit thing with Pokemon, like, oh, why aren't all the Pokemon going to be in Sword and Shield? Why can't they just port it? That's why, presumably. Presumably, yeah. There's a hundred reasons why you would have to then go back and redo all of it. And all of that is, you know, uh, like, if let, let's, let's say you gave me, somehow magically, all of the assets, right? You gave me the... You, you had gone and created brand new particle effects. You gave me all the sound effects. 
you'd gone and converted all the animations and you gave me the model files, I would still probably need to work for two weeks to make that Skylander. Right. Right. So it's like, uh, and, and that would be just me say doing it in unreal, right. Not having done 30 or 40 already. Right. So they probably came up with ways to make it more and more efficient. And the people who actually worked on it could probably give you more information on how they took something that was so difficult and made it something that you could do in a year or two. Right. Uh, but I just hope I can give you some idea of how much work it actually is just to take one Skylander and recreate it, you know, uh, that's, that's what, uh, end space had to do when they ported Spyro's adventure to Xbox right. and PlayStation, they didn't like take the, the code that, you know, we made, they basically were playing builds every day and then trying to recreate what they saw in the build in their engine. Wow. Yeah. How long and did they so, have? Uh, about it, I think they had the, the, the final year that we had, they had most of that year. Right. Even uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Wow, to a make, short amount of time. To make all of, to make both of those ports, yeah. And um, they were doing this while development was still actively going on mm. on the game, right? Yeah. So they would have to, they would have to play the game every day just to know if we changed something. And they would have to notice that it changed so that they could change it. Right. Wow. Yeah. So, so we had, uh, uh, some of our producers, like I know my friend, Mike Graham spent weeks over there, uh, with them doing that, playing the game, writing up notes saying, Oh, you know, I've been involved over at toys for Bob, uh, and this changed and we didn't notice it. So let's, let's talk about how we're going to fix that. Right. Like, and it's just this massive effort by by then. I think it was Endspace, was it? I hope I'm not miscrediting it because whoever whoever the developers were that that essentially they they did what the the Spyro Reimagined trilogy did with Spyro, they did with the Wii version of Skylander Spyro's Adventure. It was a, a big deal. Uh, XPEC. Yes, XPEC. Thank you. That's it. There we go. They're the ones. Uh, yeah, XPEC. They did a they did a essentially what what toys for rob did with the, the the three spyro games by by remaking them just from you know without using the original assets that's basically what they did mm. uh, because they also had to up res all the assets right yeah because all, all of the things that we had done for we and those assets generally you know were lower poly we didn't take advantage of shaders really uh, so you could do a whole lot in terms of making them look better, you know, normal mapping and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, so they were also responsible for those games look great. Uh, but there were at the end still a few differences. Like, uh, I remember one of the ones that pained me particularly was when I was watching you play the game, uh, and some money fell off the edge of the world and get to collect it. And you said, well, that sucks. And I'm like, damn it, we fixed that in the Wii oh, version. Right. But it fixed, you know, it was a really late fix, right? And it's the sort of thing that probably was not going to be at the high end of the priority list, you know, for those ports. But it's still, it was like, oh, no. It's funny in retrospect. I was going to say, I, one of the things that struck me uh, when watching the series was how many people mentioned you and your yeah, playthrough. Yeah, it was very, very flattering. And the thing, the thing is, is like for 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 most of us, uh, when the game came out, uh, it came out the same week as I think it was Battlefield Three, and Battlefield Three was having a whole bunch of launch issues and stuff, and so all of the stories, like all of the all of the video game journalists in the industry were busy writing about Battlefield Three. And they weren't going to be able to get to Spyro for like a week or so. And you were, you were like the only thing. And it was so awesome because uh, we got to watch you enjoy it before any of the reviews came in. Mm. Uh, but that never happens, right? Like you don't, you never get to uh, like, because uh, I, I think a lot of people didn't expect when Skylanders came out. Uh, 
which is, you know, uh, is it a Spyro game? Is it something different, right? What is, what is the deal with the toys? All of that stuff. And I think a lot of people were pleasantly surprised by it. But that also meant that, you know, people weren't putting it high up on their list of things to review, you know? Uh, so it made kind of an interesting open where watching people do Let's Plays of it was how we could see whether or not people were enjoying it. And watching you kind of at, at the beginning being skeptical, but, you know, willing to try it and then kind of fall in love with it, like that was important to us emotionally, sort of sitting there, you know, we're working, we're, we're starting work on Giants because we're pretty sure this is going to be successful, but we don't know how successful, you know, we don't know like what, what, pe what are people going to like about it, what people aren't going to like about it. And uh, it, it, it gave us all something to rally around. When you bring out a new video, there would literally be an email alert. <laughs> Everybody would stop what they were doing on Giants and watch your video. Like, it meant a lot to us. And I think the fact that everyone brought it up is is important. So I wanted to, to bring it up one more time that, like, it was a really interesting thing that on this really, really, this thing that turned into a multi-billion dollar franchise, first person to cover it was a kid on YouTube you know yeah it's just really really and and you know, nobody really got to know about that except us uh so i think all of us wanted to share some of it yeah anyway that's i, I just wanted to go off on that for well, since everybody thank you it. i mean it's uh, playing skylanders the the people i've met um like you or now everyone at toys <laughs> above um <laughs> and uh and uh, the experiences that you've all given me through the, the games that you've made and from talking to you and, and hanging out with you and whatnot, it, it's, it's been really important because it has shaped my life um, and, and changed me as a person. It's a, hopefully a better person. Um, I mean, it's I've, in regards to you, I mean, you've been doing that since way before Skylanders because you made Ratchet and <laughs> like that, that was a defining point in my, like, I guess early teens and that was like that's it's it's such a games have such a wonderful way of changing people uh for in, in the best way possible um, yeah and and i know that you you are aware that there is that responsibility and there is that impact but i think at the same time um much like when you make like like I do, I can make videos on YouTube and people say, oh, I love your videos and whatnot. It's easy to forget just how important your videos can be. It's also yeah. easy to forget how important your games uh, can be. And yeah, I, I, I wanted to make this series because I wanted to learn about Skylanders and I wanted to learn about the industry. But there's also uh, a part that hopefully you can all understand uh, from our perspective but you really have shaped our lives. Um, and it's mm -hmm. so, it's such an important thing for us. Uh, and, and yeah, it, it, it means, it means everything. I, I do understand. Yeah. I, I don't think I understood when I was making it. Like, so when I was making Ratchet, uh, you know, back then, the, this was before comment sections. Right. So back then, the way that you like pretty much you got reviews uh, and you got letters from people, but you didn't get to know, you know, uh, and I think that, that not getting to know is a is a theme that I keep seeing in my own life and just in this situation. Right. Is like you didn't know how much your YouTube videos meant to us. We didn't know when we were making it how much these things would mean to everybody, you know. But they did. And uh, uh, if, if I only found out, uh, let, let's, let's say that I'm only finding out about one-tenth of a percent of the effect that these games have had on people, right? Uh, and the rest I don't get to know. Uh, it seems like that's a theme in, in all our lives. You had a huge effect on us and you didn't know. And we had a huge effect on you and we didn't And you just don't know. Uh, but when, you, when you're blessed with an opportunity to know, when someone comes and tells you, 
it's very humbling. And uh, uh, I mean, the, probably the, the the best thing I can say is, is is thank you for giving me that chance. That's all. Uh, I've wanted to make games since I was a kid, and now I'm making games and people are telling me that they matter to them. And that's really all I want. So thank you for telling me, for letting me know. And then also in your own life, know that maybe you're also having size influence that you don't get to know about except for the one-tenth of one percent. Yeah, that's a, a, a beautiful way to put it. But let's talk about video games. Yeah, let's talk about Skylanders again. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, <laughs> hey, from one uh, sentimental moment to potentially another, uh, DJ Jams asks, uh, was there anything from Skylanders that you learned about as a team or as an individual? Um, well, I can tell you some stuff that I learned about games. Yeah, uh, I don't know about, like, like necessarily truths I realized about myself or anything like that, but... Uh, if if you'd asked me before I worked on Skylanders if it was possible to make a game that was fun to play without being hard, I don't know if I could have told you yes. Right? Like, uh, Skylanders can be hard, especially if you put it in hard mode, right? But uh, Skylanders is also fun when it's easy because it had to be. Uh, because if if you want to as the player you can take a max level skylander put them on the portal on level one and just breeze through and we had to figure out how to make that fun even if it's not hard right so the concept of like pleasurable combat sends difficulty what does that mean that was a really interesting thing to explore for me uh so like ratchet uh, was a good guiding model for me on this. Ratchet is hard, but it's not like super Meat Boy hard. Do you Unless know I mean? you're playing with the wrench. <laughs> Unless you're playing wrench only. But we didn't. We didn't mean for yes. want you to play that. Uh, it actually in Ratchet too, if I remember correctly, put systems in there to make it so that it was not possible to do what you did. So huh. uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, well, I sure know, it was, showed it was you. Not, <laughs> it was not a play modality we were going, but the thing is, is uh, uh, it wasn't that we were designing the game not to be hard. It was the problems we were designing to be solved were fun to solve, whether they were hard or not. Right. So, like, uh, I have fun playing Sudoku, even if the puzzle isn't hard. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I just sort of have fun solving that puzzle. Yeah, it's a it's relaxing. Satisfying. Yeah, and uh, and and I have fun playing Ratchet even when it's not. And I have fun playing it when it is. And then when it when it comes to Skylanders, I was just trying to figure out like what qualitatively was it about Ratchet that made it fun to play even when it wasn't hard? Because I need to know that right now so that we could we could do this. And uh, what it comes down to is strategy versus tactics. So a strategy is uh, your overall goal, right? Like uh, our overall goal as an army is to take out the mothership, right? Uh, the tactics are the individual moves that you use in order to accomplish your strategy, right? Right. Uh, when Ratchet is at its most fun, it is very strategic and not very tactical. Uh, and that is sort of the, the combat lesson I took to use in Skylanders and from Skylanders was if you can focus on fun strategies and very simple, like very simple tactics that are useful in different, that are useful, uh, two different amounts in different situations, right? And then have them use those very simple tactics to accomplish very interesting strategies. You can get combat that is fun, whether or not it's hard. And that was a real revelation to me because I didn't know what it was necessarily before I tried to study it and figure that out. Uh, so like, let's, let's take Ratchet as an example, because this is kind of a, kind of a big heady, way of looking at it but like uh 
when you're going through a ratchet level, at least in, let's say, the PlayStation 2 ones, mm -hmm. uh, what I was thinking about as a designer was how to present you with different combinations of enemies and, and different arrangements of level design features that would make you want to switch to a different weapon. Right? So uh, you run into room number one, and there's a whole bunch of swarmers, so you switch to your bomb and you kill all the swarmers, right? You run into room number two, and there's a whole bunch of swarmers, but there's also a big, giant robot torso floating over a, a, a pit, firing at you, right? What's your biggest priority in that situation? Maybe it's not the swarmers, so I switch away from the, I switch away from the bomb to my rocket launcher, because I'm only targeting one thing. If I was shooting my rocket launcher at the swarmers, it might be a waste of ammo, right? Like, so I'm making these high-level strategic decisions, but the tactical decision is really which weapon, rather than like... Uh, and then within the weapon, it's like, how am I using this weapon to best effect in this situation, right? But the weapons themselves are, are often like a very simple thing that's just useful in a whole bunch of different ways. Does that make sense? Yeah. So strategy, yeah. strategy and tactics. In Skylanders, it was very similar, but instead of w wanting making you want to switch weapons, it's making you want to switch Skylanders. So every Skylander, like I was saying earlier, can be good at a certain number of things, and uh, based on the ones that you have, and this, the combination of the situation in front of you, you might want to switch so that you can get a, 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 a tactical advantage, right? But the overall strategy is satisfying whether or not you have that tactical advantage. Uh, so that's that's what I learned. Uh, it was hopefully that wasn't too boring of an no, explanation. No, that was really really interesting. Oh, okay, cool. Yes, yeah, so, but that that's that's sort of like combat design in a nutshell. When you're thinking of like if you have two sliders, strategy and tactics, right? Like how much do you want of each in your combat system, right? Ratchet and Skylanders picked high strategy middle lowish tactics for the weapons but that's not necessarily the only right way to do it right you as a designer get to choose where those sliders go and your whole combat system there's going to be knock-on effects from there and the fact that that's an option is what i learned from uh from skylanders more than anything else mm. i mean it's, it's really interesting because when you put it like that it seems so obvious but that's what you're doing like but it's also I do not have a developer's brain to think about that whilst I'm playing. I'm just thinking about oh, this is fun. I'm I'm having fun here. You see, we had to sort of figure that out too because yeah. we didn't know it beforehand. Like we would make some levels and be like, "This was really fun in that level. Why was it really fun? Let's try to put more of that in other levels." You know. So it's it. I can talk about it now, having already had a problem, uh, and it seems sort of obvious. But it was. It also wasn't obvious to us at the time necessarily. Random tangent, uh, if another Ratchet game is ever announced, I'm going to do everything in my power to contact Insomniac Games and make sure it's completable with only the wrench. <laughs> and you know what? It, they, there should be an achievement called uh, Do It Like Teal or something. That would be incredible. <laughs> I, I feel like actually using the word teal would be would be too obvious. Make it Game Master. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, there you go. The real game master, yeah. that's the name of the achievement. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and everyone would hate it. <laughs> it would be it would be the number one on all those lists of this is the hardest platinum trophy to get. Because this would one you... challenge is like, yes me, I did that. That's my time. <laughs> if you uh, you know, if you if you gotta be famous for something, you know, uh, or infamous for something, you know, might as well. <laughs> Pixar seven asks how closely if at all did uh, Toy Bob and Vicarious Visions work with the people making the Skylanders Academy series and also the Skylanders books. Uh, I wasn't. I, I was working uh, uh, for my consulting company at the making movies and the books, uh, so I didn't actually see a lot of how those were made. Uh, I do know that the the production company that makes uh, Skylanders Academy, uh, like. Activision created a production company to make television shows oh, for this show, right? So uh, I think that means that, you know, 
the, that these people had access to the developers and the developers had access to these people during the development of it. But when you're making, when you're making a game and when you're making something in linear media, the things that are important to you to tell a story or to, to, to get across what you're trying to get across are very different. Uh, and the hooks that you need into characters in order to get things across are, are, are different. So we, we, we knew that they would have to make changes. And I imagine that uh, uh, at the very least, people at the high levels were, were, were being kept abreast of this because, uh, but I, I, since I wasn't there, I don't know for sure. But I do know that Activision spun up of its own to do this. Uh, and so it's, and, and then made a deal with Netflix. So it's, uh, it's not, it, it sounds plausible that, uh, Toys for Bob or VV or whoever could have been, uh, involved in like consulting with them, helping them. But I'm guessing that they were too busy, you know, working on whichever game they were working on to actually do, do work on it, you know, like, uh, write for it or animate for it or things like that. Sally Weffer asks, looking back with the new experience you've gained over the past decade or so, is there something that you would change or do differently during the development of the original Skylanders? I don't know. Uh, I think the around Giants, we had sort of the perfect number of Skylanders in the game. I think I might have suggested sticking with that number instead of trying for larger numbers. Uh, of toys with each game because I, I feel like with giants it had a really good collectability like you could e even if you weren't the kind of person who wanted to get all you could like oh i want to get all the dragons or i want to get all the air ones you know like uh i felt like it, it was the the more skylanders there were on offer per game the less the less of that kind of like oh i want to get a portion of the collection feeling there was so i i might that, that might be the, the, the thing I'd say. Fair enough. Is fewer toys per game uh, in order to make it easier to collect sets. Uh, Sally also asks, would you encourage an aspiring indie developer to make a Toys to Life game, or would you advise they start with something simpler? Well, like, uh, to start with, right, you'd have to sell toys. Uh, and I don't, I don't know if that's possible to do as an indie. If you had a studio already and you had investors lined up and you had a pipeline for the toys and you had someone who knew how to do the electronics to make the portal and you already had a prototype, right? Like that's that's probably a good time to start thinking about how the indie version of Toys to Life. But if you're like if you're not independently wealthy, you, uh, you're trying to do this on your own and you do it as a sustainable business model. I don't think Toys to Life is going to be your, your easiest bet because it involves a huge amount of money up front. You know, you don't know how much how many you're going to sell. So like if you're an indie and you sell 10,000 units, you can make a lot of money if you didn't spend a lot of money making it, right? But if you spend a lot of money making it and you only sell 10,000 units, then you're in trouble. So you got to kind of figure out where that balance lies for your studio. Jeb Shook uh, says, Eruptor has always been my favorite Skylander, and he holds a yes. very special place in my heart. So it'd be really cool to hear some behind the scenes info on him. Do you have anything? He he barfs. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, I love Eruptor also. Uh, I also, you know, I think he's one of the characters named what he was. Like his development name, as far as I ever remember, was Eruptor. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, and he, I don't, I don't have any, like his attacks were what they were. He looked like what he looked like. Uh, I think the reason why Eruptor is so good is because like they nailed him right. you know? <laughs> in, in the prototype character. They just nailed what Eruptor was, uh, like that, the, the, the lava barf and the, uh, the throwing the, uh, the balls of lava and the, like the, the sort of way he's shaped like a sort of Pillsbury Doughboy-ish, like all that stuff didn't really change. Uh, so I think it's a testament, like it shows just how, how high of a quality Eruptor is, that he came off the page fully born, you know? Mm. 
it's rare to say that of Skyline. Like even Spyro changed a lot, trying to get uh, uh, the right feeling for Spyro's charge move, that sort of thing. Mm. Uh, I remember there being a lot of iteration on, but I don't remember there being iteration, a lot of iteration on Eruptor, but I might just be misremembering it. Uh, but I feel like that's just because Eruptor was so strong right out the gate. He basically leapt off the page, fully formed. Bitfire5 asks, as a self-proclaimed game designer, I'm curious about what the level design process was when making levels. I came in after the project had already been going on for a while, so there was a whole bunch of content. So the way that we made content for Spyro's Adventure was a bit different than the way we made it for the other games. Uh, Spyro's Adventure, a lot of it was trying to to use the content that we made in that first year to to build into uh you know the content that we would actually ship with and then on giants it was like designing uh it, it was more like what, what i'm used to with those if that makes sense so uh on skylanders uh the level design team made a whole bunch of levels and we were uh, we were getting them all ready to ship, and this was, I think it was 2010. We were thinking we were going to ship, and then uh, we got an extra year, and in that extra year, all of the levels changed again. So for SSA, it was very different. I don't know that there's a like a, a specific process I can point to, but once once it, once we got past that, and we weren't trying to. The, the the content because we already used it we were it was it was more like a, a, a level designer sits down and does some uh, gray box work so they go in and they might have a concept say uh, I'm going to make a village for a whole bunch of puppet people right and then they would lay out a rough village with some some rough functionality in it you know, uh, maybe use some enemies that we already had, like the Chompies, and just give you an idea of what it would feel like. And uh, once, like, that, uh, they would do reviews on that, people would give feedback and play through it, then do a couple of iterations, then Art would come in and uh, actually make it look really nice. And then usually you do another design pass after that, to fix up all the stuff that broke while you weren't looking at it because so there's this there's this thing that happens where like um like, you remember i was working uh, on I, I i had you play a little uh, rpg that i yes. was working on a demo great. for uh what happens like if i were to load that up today it wouldn't run right, right? Uh, there would be hundreds of bugs in them that weren't there when i shut it down two years ago Right, I I don't know. Like it, you know, maybe maybe I'll uh, operating system update, or I'll have uh, updated Unity, you know, any number of things, and I'll press play and stuff won't work, and I'll have it'll it'll be hours of work to try to get that thing working again. Uh, that happens while you're developing things too, because like let's say I'm working on a level and I stop working on this level so that somebody else can work on it, right? I uh, art is going to come in and, and make it look really nice, right? So I put that off to the side. But during that time, things are still changing. You know, the engine is still getting updates. Uh, and, you know, uh, the, you know, I haven't been looking at that to make sure that new bugs haven't been introduced for a while. So then I get it back and it's like, oh, wow, this doesn't work anymore. So then you make it work again. And uh, then you usually send it off to user testing. And then you start iterating on it. So you you watch user tests, you see, like, when you design a level, you know in your head, I want people to, to take about this long in this area and then go to this next area and take about this long, right? And if you watch the user test and people are taking 10 to 20 times as you want them to at something, you use that data to go fix that thing and make it take more like the time you want it to. Uh, so then it's just a, a process of iteration from there until the game ships. So also by Spitfire, in the series it was mentioned that there was a big level purge where 
it became from like a, a hundred tiny levels to 20 plus massive ones. Um, yes. Was yeah. there anything in particular that you can remember from this that wasn't present in the final version or anything noteworthy? We, man, we were really, really good at using this. Uh, the stuff that didn't make it was like usually little fragments, uh, you know, like rocks or buildings, right? Like we used practically everything. <laughs> uh, the, you know, like uh, most of the, I would say it's like when, when it came to all those tiny, tiny levels we had, most of them became like Cali challenges or they got worked up into a bigger level uh, or all like that level got cut, but all the pieces that made up that level got assembled which is sort of like taking a broom and then taking the brush off and replacing it with a new brush and then replacing the handle and then the brush and like, is it the same broom sort of thing? Uh, the Toon Grump asks, how oh, the fuck? Uh, I think I can work this out. How difficult was it to give these hundreds of characters unique enough personalities and voice lines? That's really hard. Uh, the, the reason it was doable is because uh, Toys for Bob's sound team was so good. They had just a top-notch uh, audio department that was just knocking it out of the park <laughs> in terms of voice lines. Uh, I don't, like, just sorting through that much material, and it, like, normally, normally you're trying to whip down uh, the number of sounds you have to do, right, so that you can get into some uh, uh, you know, we have to fit it on disc, we have to uh, stream it while you're... Uh, so, like, let's say it's a, an audio line, we have to load that in before we play it, or we have to stream it like playing a CD, but that involves some extra work, and so, like, normally you're trying to minimize the amount, but Toys for Bob's sound team was just like, no, we want them all to sound great and sound different. And it really made a huge difference. And then going forward, like that was the, that was sort of the expectation, you know, that, that all the rest of the games would, would meet was that they, they were these very rich sounding characters. I, I think you heard about this from e but they would go to, like they would go down to Activision and sit in a conference room and just come up with dozens and dozens of ideas for characters and Iwe would draw them and they would just keep doing this. And then uh, Activision's CEO at the time, Eric Hirschberg, he was, he was really good at uh, like his, his ability to tell when like the areas that a Skylander's personality could be improved to be stronger. He had such good instincts for it. And so, but the problem is when you're a CEO, you're so valuable. Like just getting an appointment, getting on someone's calendar is really hard because everybody wants to talk to you. So they would, they would camp in a, in, a, in a conference room and whenever Eric had a few extra minutes, he would come through the conference room and give them feedback on the characters and then they would do a whole bunch more and then he'd come back and give them more feedback. And so between the three of them, they would come back from these with all of these really strong character concepts. And then like just in the drawing and the pose and the name you could already see a lot of what that character would become and then it became the character team's job to really fulfill that and but like that was once the pipeline got going like early on that was one of the challenges they had to figure out how to get good at right was how do we identify early on like whether or not these characters have enough character, you know? Uh, like, how, how do you quantify that, you know? And so they had to figure out which which team members were the best at identifying and solving these and then making all of that work, and then they did. The, uh, the Toon Grump also asks, who did the packaging art for all of the Skylanders games? Was the, Were they done in-house or were they made by outside companies? I think usually the way it worked was Activision, uh, like like every publisher, when you when you want to do a marketing campaign, you have uh, different marketing firms that you work with. They do bids where they say, "Oh, here's the campaign we would do," or "Here's the campaign we would do," and then you pick the the most. Um, and I'm pretty sure that's how we did it with uh, Skylanders as well. So 
the that that means for the the box art for all of that that stuff was being decided as part of the the marketing campaign so it was probably being done by the the marketing company who was being responsible for the campaign oh, okay cool i might be wrong but that uh we would we would have input on it like uh they would send us oh here's what the box is going to be like here's some box prototypes you know and we would look at it from a usability standpoint hey you know we really want to make sure that we're like this game has these features. We want to make sure they're highlighted in the art. But most of the time, it's like, wow, that's really cool. You know, that's about all the the, the input you have on it. Borto YT asks, what code was Skylanders made with? And uh, what code languages are a good idea to learn today for someone trying to get into coding or programming? I think if I, think if I understand correctly what they're asking, what programming language was the engine built in that made Skylanders? Probably C or some variant of C, like C sharp or C plus plus. Probably not C sharp. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and say nobody codes an engine in C sharp, but uh, C or C plus plus, I would imagine. The first two Skylanders games were made in the TFB tool. That was the the, the game engine they were working with, and it was uh, what TFB had made in house over the years. I think. Uh, Several people covered it during the series, uh, but that that tool that the the engine they were working with, uh, they weren't using. So the the people who made the Skylanders, right, and the people who made the levels and the people who did all that, they weren't working in C, right. The people who made the tool were working in C. The people who made the game out of the tool were working in TFB script, which was a thing that only existed in this engine. It was a visual programming language. It was very nifty and very powerful. Uh, but it didn't do anything that a language like C doesn't do, right? Uh, okay, so fast forward to, to today. Uh, the situation we're looking at, the vast majority of them are not made anymore using proprietary engines. Uh, it, it does still happen. Like Insomniac still does it. Great, right? Like they and they get a huge advantage out of it because their technology can do whatever they want. Uh, but but for the most part, by and large, people are not making things like there. There are devoted companies who are making game engines, and then people are using those game engines to make games. Um, so learning how to use those games is probably like and and uh the two biggest ones right now are unity and uh unreal engine uh at the moment it's unreal engine 4 uh, i think unity goes by years at this point so it'd be 2020 or 2019 um but they're both great uh they're both four different things at the moment like generally speaking uh unity is really great if you're trying to make 2D games or mobile games, and generally speaking, Unreal is really great if you're trying to make uh, uh, games for consoles. But uh, you can make anything in either engine, and it would be great. But if you learn how to make things in those two engines, you'll probably have the skills you need uh, to to make things in the industry. So if you're a programmer specifically. I would suggest you learn a language that's like C or, or probably C++ at this point so that you know how that works. Uh, Unreal Engine, the, the programming side of things is all C++. Uh, Unity side, most of the time you're not working with the engine code because you have to start to do that. So you're working, but you're working in script, which is in C sharp. So, C sharp is uh, a lot like C plus plus, but uh, it's like way easier to use. I uh, as advice for you as a as a program, pick up Unreal, try to do stuff in it using C plus plus and using their scripting language Blueprint. Pick up Unity, try to do stuff in it using C sharp, and you'll you'll begin to understand the scope of the skills you need in order to make games. Domino Pivot asks, if you're talking to a programmer, here are a few quick silly ones. Which is the worst programming language? 
That, well, there isn't a worse programming language because the uh, because the the rest of the question is uh, which is the worst programming language to do what? Uh, that's that's always the question is what are you doing? Then you can find out what the best programming language is for. But I'm going to tell you the answer. The answer is Lisp. Lisp is the worst programming <laughs> language. Uh, tabs or spaces? I, I like using tabs and then having them get turned into spaces. <laughs> but I'm kind of weird. Do you have a rubber duck or do you explain your code to a Skylander when you're stuck on a bug? <laughs> uh, I don't think that's me. Uh, I think I know what you're talking about, though. Like, trying to explain it out loud. Yeah, yeah. when I get stuck on a problem, uh, my rubber duck is Mary, my wife. I usually explain it to her. And in the process of explaining it to her, I sort of have to to reformat everything in a clear enough way that i can understand the problem better and so i imagine that's probably why people talk it out loud to a rubber duck or to something right is just needing to get it into your verbal centers forces you to organize it in such a way that helps you solve the problem and it's true it, it does work cool Excellent questions, Domino. Sergeant Bird, 90,068. Uh, wow, that's a lot of Sergeant that Birds. That is a lot of birds. Uh, was Flynn originally designed as a reference to the balloonist from Spyro 1, or did they just think of a hot air balloon for transportation first and it became a happy coincidence? I don't know. Uh, I don't know who came up with them. He was originally just the balloonist, and he wasn't intended to be the main character yeah, I'm not sure what the actual answer is. I love Flynn, though. Final person. Old Man Tiger Mask, which is a fantastic name. What was the most memorable moment during the development of any of the Skylanders? During the development. Okay, so, so not counting, like, at uh, release of it. So just while we're making it. The most memorable moment. Uh, okay, so I don't know about most memorable, but this is one I love. Uh, I was... Uh, I had come down to visit the Toys for Bob. I had come up from, from Activision to visit. Uh, one of the things that Mike Graham were wanted them to focus on was there were a lot of places in the game where it was unclear. Like, so Skylands is made up of a bunch of floating islands, right? Some of these islands you can walk off the edge of and land on an island below. And some of the edges you walk off and you die. You just plummet to your death. And so we were suggesting, hey, why don't we put some fences up or something so that people know where the, the death area is and where the, the don't falling down area is. And uh, uh, in the course of it, uh, I had to say, uh, or I got to say probably one of my favorite things I've ever said, which was reading the designer's mind is not a skill-based activity. <laughs> <laughs> Because it was like, it's like, oh well, isn't it kind of fun to to have to find these things, right? And the answer is yes, it is kind of fun to have to find these things. But like the, but generally you find them not by reading the, right? <laughs> like, so it was like in this case, it feels a little bit like you're asking me to, read, and I don't, I don't feel like that's asking me to do something skilled. So that that was kind of funny, uh, but uh, I don't know if it was the most, the the most amazing thing of the whole development. I, I, or the most memorable, but it was the first thing I remembered when you asked me. I got to say the best thing I've ever seen. <laughs> How has the series impacted you personally in your life? Probably the biggest way is like people that, and it, it took a while. The people who have come and told me that it, it meant a lot to them, that like um, when you make games for kids, uh, I, I, I learned this on Ratchet, and I, it, I'm just getting to the point now with Skylander. The kids grow up eventually, and some of them come. The game meant to them when I was a kid, you know? So, like, with Ratchet, uh, people told me, you know, my mom and my dad were going through a divorce. And uh, when I would go to my dad's house, we'd play Ratchet together, and I remember just being so happy. Stuff like that, right? Uh, and, like, more than anything else... Uh, I think those stories affect me. Uh, and, and I'm starting to get crops of those in from Skylanders now where people say, hey, I just want to say thank you. you. I played this with my family. It was something that me and my little sister could both play and not fight about or things like that, you know, just uh, 
or who or they talk about you know how they love to toy or i hear stories about uh you know like uh, uh i i have my own relatives who were my, my i had cousins who were the exact right age for skylanders uh when it came out so at the time i would get to see you know like my littlest cousin got a pin you know like you put on your shirt and it was a spyro from skylanders and she tried to put it on the portal it didn't work and she didn't Aww. understand right and like that taught me something about what we were doing with the portal as a fantasy do you know like yeah so there's been like just just in terms of seeing think you know stories like that or things like that from people that i know uh that's probably been the biggest impact on me for for games in general but for skylanders too and the the older the children who played the game get the more of these stories i hear so that's that's very that continues to be a very fulfilling thing do you ever have the itch to keep working on a new skylander adventure oh sure yeah i mean i uh, and i miss working on ratchet too like it it uh you know uh the way it works for me is if i work on three in a row i'm tired of it for 10 years <laughs> <laughs> uh other than that I, i'm still interested right so like uh, i i worked on three and then it was like oh man like this is really hard uh like continuing to do this and then uh you know i worked on three skylanders in a row and i was like oh man i think it's just my attention span like i need to uh every so often just refresh it with something new but then with ratchet you know 10 years later i got to come back and help him out with nexus and uh the ps4 game so i clearly wasn't tired of ratchet i just needed a little break working on something else for a while yeah I, yeah I'm, I'm i'm down i would do it it's it's like it's not like uh i don't want to do you know like yeah. uh yeah just give me 10 yeah years. it's just i just needed a break for a while uh but i i wouldn't mind oh you know it's actually I, I, just to go off slightly uh it's funny because i i see a lot uh like yesterday i saw a headline um somebody saying that uh, uh somebody asked the creator of beautiful joe if he'd make another beautiful joe and he said well yes but it's not up to me right and the idea that came out of that was sort of like oh well if we all get the publisher to do it then the game could happen and and he says he's on board and that's sort of not really what he was saying <laughs> you know like it's it, what he's saying is like uh were the situation to line up yes right but the situation hasn't lined up and it a lot could happen before it could line up like the only reason i was able to work those extra ratchet games was because i was freelance at the time right i'm not freelance now i'm i'm now that i'm uh employed by toys for bob so i couldn't work on another ratchet game if it came up right like so it's it's not always up to us you know it depends on where you are and, uh uh you know what you're currently working on when the uh, opportunities become available and everything it seems like what they're asking is do i think another skylanders should be made and then yeah like and and like when, when people say like oh there'll never be another like how much how really how much can you take that seriously like it was a massively successful franchise like they'll make more you know like oh after mario sunshine why would they make another nobody says that you know yeah. like of course of course there will be one eventually and the people who work on it though will be it will it will vastly be depending on what else they were working on when the opportunities came along i guess uh, we have one more question and it's from me <laughs> Oh my god. What? Whoa. What games do you play in your spare time or have been playing recently? Ah, yes. Okay. Um, World of Warcraft. I play a lot of World of Warcraft. Nice. I recently learned how to play the auction house. And so I uh, there's a amount that costs 5 million gold. Uh, so I, I set it a goal for myself to earn 5 million gold by playing the auction house. And then I did. And now I'm trying to get one for Mary. Nice. Uh, so I play a lot of WoW. Um, 
The other game I've been playing recently, Layer of the Clarkwork God. It's a adventure game slash platformer by Size Five, people who brought you the the Kickmen game and the Swindle. It's a、uh, it's really interesting because、uh, it's like half adventure game and half platformer, but that's sort of like it's it that's just the doorway. To get you into it, the like the game is、uh, a lot. They 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 put a lot of different types of games into that game. Like just the amount of the amount of of new work that goes into each chapter of that game was kind of amazing to me, coming from an indie studio. Because like normally the way you do it is you make. You 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 develop a mechanic, a really good mechanic, and then you develop content for that mechanic, right?、Uh, and then each level is additional content that supports and increases that mechanic until you get to the end and you resolve it. And you what you don't usually do is like、uh, create a mechanic,、uh, work through the mechanic, introduce a new mechanic, and then just keep doing that. Like it's. The amount it, it's so cool, like how much different stuff they put in that game. That's awesome.、Uh, I just finished it last night, and I liked it.、Uh, it's very funny.、Uh, some, some, sometimes frustrating, but、uh, you know what game isn't? I've never heard of it. I'm gonna have to look it up. I yeah, I liked it a lot. It's、uh, if if you like adventure games and or platformers. Yep.、Uh, it it does both. Cool.、Uh, I have I played it with a keyboard and had some issues. I've heard a lot about controller. Right,、uh, Hollow Knight is、uh, a lot easier with a controller. Oh yeah, is that is that by the、uh, that's that's not by the Sword Knight people, is it? No, it's um, it was a company called Team Cherry. It was their first ever game,、Got、and it. it's a、uh, it's、okay. what I would consider the best Metroidvania ever made. Interesting. Yeah, it is、okay. phenomenal. <laughs> the interesting thing about this、uh, is that the characters know what kind of they're in. So the the There, there are two adventure game characters, and one of them decided he wanted to be an indie platformer darling, and so they're they're basically at odds with each other over what kind of game is. I, I found it、uh, very funny.、Uh, the gag that, that sold me the game was、uh, the platformer guy says to the adventure game guy, "At least call it crafting." <laughs> like when it comes to combining shit in your inventory, I was like, "Yes, yes, <laughs> they know, they know." It's cool when it's crafting. It's not cool when it's combining things in an inventory. Well, as always, it is an absolute pleasure to have you on the channel.、Um, it was good to talk to you too, Teal. And we, I... we need to do Ratchet Mobile. <laughs> <laughs> yes, going mobile. That would be a terrible time. Because <laughs> we tried to do that. Yeah, and, I, I、uh, mean, it wasn't that it didn't go well. It was more of I think like. It was it, it was hard to to get the controller to work properly, so I want to see and try and do it better and see if I can actually wrench only it. It's entirely possible, but the game is not programmed to be uh, wrenching uh, all the time because、um, it just wasn't. But I like to believe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I have never played the game all the way through, so. That would be a new one for me. It was, it was interesting, though. I liked it. Thank you very much for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, leave a like, subscribe, share the video around. I also have a Twitch, a Twitter, and a Patreon if you'd like to support me and the channel. This has been an incredible series, and unfortunately, this is the end. I'd love to talk to more members of the company again, especially studio heads, but they're all incredibly busy at the moment. Hopefully, we answered a good set of your questions. Obviously, we couldn't get to all of them, and Mike, who I was speaking to, wouldn't know the answer to some of them. But I think we did a good job, and I'm very proud of this series. Thank you so much for watching and making this series feel special. And I will see you next time. Take care. Bye bye.